Hello, and welcome to the first part of the Forest Mapping and Monitoring with SAR Data webinar series. I'm Dr. Erica Podest, and I'm a scientist in the Earth Science Division at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. This series has been assembled by several RSET instructors, including Dr. Amber McCollum and Dr. Juan Luis Torres Perez from NASA Ames, and scientist Sean McCartney from NASA Goddard. This is a four-part webinar series, and today's webinar is focused on time series analysis with SAR data, and this includes a demonstration using Google Earth Engine. For this training, we have four two-hour sessions. The next ones will be on May 14th, 19th, and 21st. We will have two sessions per day. One session will be in English and the other one will be in Spanish. And there will be uh, the same uh, material. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here. And after each session, we will have a question and answer uh, session. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box along the way and we will try to get to as many uh, questions as possible at the end of the session. We will post the questions and answers on our website after the training. If we don't get to a question, you can also email me or my colleagues, Dr. McCollum or Dr. Torres Perez, at the email addresses listed here. Homework and certificates. We will have one homework and it will cover content from not only the lecture but from the exercises as well. And to receive credit for the homework, you must submit all your answers via Google Forms. The link to the homework will be available uh, through the RCEP webpage. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all four live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process the, the certificate, so you can expect to receive them in about two months after the completion of the course. So the prerequisites to this webinar series are the Introduction to Synthetic Aperture Radar webinar series, as well as the Advanced Webinar SAR for Land Cover Applications. These are both RSET webinars, and you can access them through the links posted here. You will also need a Google Earth Engine uh, in order to do the demo that we'll be doing at the end of this uh, uh, session and you can uh, set up an account for free by following the link here. And finally, in terms of the course materials, we will be posting the PDF presentations as well as the recordings of each week's webinar on the RSEP webpage, and you can access that through that last link here. As a reminder, this webinar series contains four trainings. The second webinar will be on Thursday, May 14th, and it will cover the use of optical and radar data for vegetation mapping. It will be taught by Dr. Amber McCollum and Dr. Juan Torres Perez. The third webinar will be next Tuesday, May 19th, and it will be focused on mapping mangroves with SAR, and it will be taught by me. The fourth and final webinar will be on Thursday, May 21st, which will be on forest height estimation and will be taught by a special guest lecturer, Professor Paul Cicada from University of Massachusetts Amherst. Learning objectives. By the end of this presentation, you'll be able to identify the unique attributes of radar data as related to forest mapping. You'll be able to understand how multiple radar images can be used to analyze change in vegetation in time. And finally, you'll be able to conduct a time series analysis of change in vegetation cover using radar data in Google Earth Engine. Let's start with a radar overview summary. If you've taken the previous SAR webinars, you will have seen a lot of this material already. So this might be a refresher or a review for some of you. Now let's uh, talk about some of the basic concepts of radar. A radar is essentially a ranging or distance measuring device. 
there are two categories of radars. There's imaging radar and there's non-imaging radar. So for example, an altimeter is a non-imaging radar. SARs are imaging radars and they are side looking because if the radar would be looking straight down, such as the figure on the left, you wouldn't be able to differentiate between the two points that you see here, points A and point B. The signal would reach each point at the same time and return to the sensor at the same time, which is why you wouldn't be able to differentiate them. Now, if you place that radar towards the side, so it's looking, it's side looking, like the figure on the right, the time that it takes for the signal to reach point A and point B is different. And therefore, you can resolve these two points. A radar is an active system because it provides its own source of illumination. Uh, a radar transmits these short bursts or pulses of microwave energy at regular intervals. And the radar beam illuminates the surface obliquely at a right angle to the motion of the platform. In this case, it's an aircraft. Now, the antenna receives a portion of the transmitted energy reflected or backscattered from various objects within the illuminated beam. In this case, it's the ground, there's a house and, and a tree. And by measuring the time delay between the transmission of a pulse and the reception of the backscattered signal from different targets, their distance from the radar and thus their location can be determined. As that sensor mo platform moves forward, recording and processing of the backscattered signals builds up a two-dimensional image of the surface. The received radar signal is the phase and the amplitude. The, the phase is provided in radians, while the amplitude is provided in decibels, in dB. And we will just be working with the amplitude here in, in these examples. In the next following slides, I'll talk about the parameters that influence the characteristics of the signal. There are radar parameters and there's surface parameters. I'll discuss these in the context of land cover mapping. And let's start with the radar parameters. There are three radar parameters that influence the transmission characteristics of the signal. These are wavelength, polarization, and incidence angle. So the first radar parameter is wavelength. And as a, you might already know from uh, previous SAR webinars, in radar remote sensing, we often talk about wavelength rather than frequency. Now, the wavelength is the distance from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next wave. And the reason we talk primarily about wavelength is because the length of the wave defines the interaction of the signal with the surface or the medium. The wavelength is inversely related to frequency, and the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength and vice versa. The table on the right lists the common wavelength bands in radar. The column on the left has the band designation and each band covers a range of frequencies. So for example, the X band range goes from eight to 12.5 gigahertz, which is equivalent to a wavelength range of 2.4 to 3.8 centimeters. Radar sensors operate at specific frequencies or at a specific frequency within that range. So if you hear of a sensor that operates at L-band, for example, it means it operates at a specific frequency within the L-band range. Note that a C-band sensor typically has a wavelength of around 5 centimeters, while an L-band sensor typically has a wavelength of around 24 centimeters, and P-band on the order of 68 centimeters. So this range in wavelengths uh, 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 from between different bands is quite large. So there are two important things to remember about wavelength. The first is that the longer the wavelength, the greater the penetration through the medium. And the second is that the length of the wave will determine the interaction with surface objects. The wave will interact with objects that are approximately its size. The figure on the left shows the extent of penetration through different mediums with different bands. In vegetated areas, X-band is generally 
dominated or governed by the top of the canopy. So uh, you're seeing just information from the top of the canopy, while with C-band, uh, it'll penetrate further, and L-band, that signal will penetrate even further into the vegetation canopy. And likewise, in the case of a dry, bare soil, X-band will only see the top surface of the soil, while L-band will penetrate somewhat into the soil. And uh, the, uh, the wetter the soils, the less the penetration. That's one thing to keep in mind. We'll talk about that a little bit further ahead. So there is a preferred wavelength depending on the type of study that you're conducting. And the table on the right lists some of these. And for example, P-band is good for studies that involve um, high uh, penetration through high biomass forests, such as those found in the tropics, and for assessing biomass. And it also penetrates deeper into soils and is good for assessing soil moisture at deeper layers than that provided by shorter wavelengths. L-band is also a very good sensor for forest and soil studies. C-band and X-band are better for agricultural studies or areas where there's lower biomass, grasslands, savannas, plantations, um, uh, plantations that have low biomass. KU-band and KA-band are typically used for uh, snow cover studies and glaciology. So ideally for vegetation studies, the best sensors are P and L-band, and there's currently no operational freely available L-band data, and there is no P-band sensor in space. However, in 2022, uh, NISAR will be launched, and it's a satellite uh, that is, it's a joint satellite mission between NASA and the Indian Space Agency, and it will have an L-band and an S-band sensor. Also around that time, the European Space Agency is planning on launching its own satellite called Biomass, which will have a P-band sensor. So here we have an example of penetration depth through vegetation with two different wavelengths. And this is in a place called Kal Kalimantan in Indonesia. The image on the top is a C-band image, which has a wavelength of about five centimeters. And the one on the bottom is a P-band image on the order of 68 centimeters, the wavelength. And these are false color composites. So the red channel has HH, the green channel has HV, and the blue channel has VV. And you can clearly see the, there, there's greater detail in the P-band image. And the purple colored area in the C-band image is likely an area of low vegetation with patches of higher vegetation in between. The P-band image shows more sensitivity to the patches in between this area. And south of the low vegetated area is a forested area with lower biomass than the area immediately uh, west of it. These areas are more distinctive in the P-band image uh, than in the C and in the C-band uh, image, just because the signal is mm, uh, penetrating through the vegetation canopy, so there's much more information content about vegetation structure. Um, also to note are the purplish areas north of the river. And in the P-band image, you can see there's some purplish areas there, and they have different forest. These are areas that probably have different forest structure or biomass. And one final thing to note, if you look closely at the P-band image, you'll notice some road structures there from on the, the west part of the image. They extend to the west. And uh, you can certainly not, you can't see that road structure uh, on the C-band image. The other radar parameter is polarization, and that refers to the plane of propagation of the electric field of the signal. So irrespective of wavelength, radar signals can be transmitted and or received in different modes of polarization. There can be four combinations of both transmit and receive polarizations, and they go as follows. There's horizontal transmit and horizontal receive, so that's HH. Vertical transmit and vertical receive, that's VV. Horizontal transmit and vertical receive, that's HV. And vertical transmit and horizontal receive, that's VH. HH and VV are referred to as like polarizations or copolarized, and HV and VH are referred to as 
cross-polarized. A system that measures all four polarizations is known as a, a quad-pole system. And polarization is useful in providing information on structure orientation. Penetration depth is also in part influenced by polarization. And in forests, HH tends to be less attenuated than VV. So HH penetrates deeper into the canopy than VV or VH. So here we have an example of a quad pole L-band SAR um, image. And this is from a, an airborne sensor called UAV SAR. It's an L-band um, airborne sensor from uh, JPL. And in 2013, this sensor acquired imagery over the Pacaya Samaria Natural Reserve, and that's located in the Peruvian Amazon. And so this reserve is a, a very large wetland ecosystem. So in this image, there's a combination of forest and, and inundated vegetation. The images in black and white, as you see, they're individual images, so they're, they're single polarizations. So there's HH, HV, and VV polarizations. And uh, you can note the differences between the, in the intensity between the different images, especially with the cross-polarized, especially with the HV image. And the degree of inhomogeneity of a surface or volume tends to depolarize the signal, causing a high return in the cross pole. So the point here is that HV um, is a very good polarization to determine um, the presence of vegetation, because the signal depolarizes when there's a lot of um, volume scattering. Here we have an RGB image of the different polarizations, and HH is in the red channel, HV is in the green channel, and VV is in the blue channel. And these false color images are a great way to visualize the contributions of the different polarizations through color combinations. You can see the information constant that's unique to each polarization, which is in, ca in this case is representative of different types of uh, wetland vegetation and non-inundated vegetation. So HV is in the green channel, and anything that is green means that the return is higher in HV than VV or HH. Anything that is magenta means that it is a uh, combination. It's a combined contribution between HH and VV. So that means both HH and VV are high. And the table uh, that I've placed here, this comes from the SAR handbook, chapter two, uh, is a really great guide that summarizes the resulting colors based on different tones of an image. So we know that if an image, if, it, if, it's, if you, do an, you have an RGB image and it, it, some areas look green, um, that means the, the area that looks green, the image that's in the green channel has a, a very bright tone. Okay, But there are all sorts of combinations of colors. So, um, you, this this um, table is, is a good guide, really, to understand how to interpret RGB images. The final sensor parameter to discuss is incidence angle, and that's the angle between the direction of the incident wave and the Earth's surface plane. In radar, the incidence angle increases across the swath from the near to the far range, and Large angles will be more sensitive to surface roughness and will penetrate less into the medium as opposed to small angles, as you can see from this uh, figure here. Uh, low incidence angles, so those are uh, perpendicular to the surface, uh, will result in higher backscatter and greater penetration. This is an example of the effect of incidence angle variation discussed in the previous slide. This is a Sentinel-1 VV image, and the radar is left looking. And if you look at the image on the left, um, that's the Sentinel-1 image, the surface appears smoother as the incidence angle increases. So that incidence angle will increase from near range to far range. And in this case, there's a 15 degree variation. In the near range, it's around 30. In the far range, it's around 45. So as we move further across the swath from near to far range, 
there's less energy that is returned to the sensor and the image becomes increasingly darker in tone. It's around 3 to 5 dB difference in backscatter. And sometimes you have to be careful when you're doing classifications, for example, uh, because um, if you select a, a, if you train your classifier with a class that's in the near range, that class will not have the same backscatter characteristics in the far range. So now let's discuss the radar signal interaction with the surface. The length of the wave will determine how it interacts with surface objects. So the wave will interact with features on the surface that are approximately the length of the wave. The size of the components of a surface will determine its roughness. And surface roughness is the average height variation in the surface cover from a plane surface. And it's measured in the order of centimeters. So whether a surface appears rough or smooth to a radar depends on the wavelength and incidence angle. A surface is considered smooth if the height variations are much smaller than the radar wavelength. And as a useful rule of thumb, the higher the backscatter intensity, the rougher the surface being imaged. So let's start with these different um, backscatter, what we call mechanisms. Uh, one is uh, a, a smooth surface. It's also known as specular reflection. So a smooth surface acts like a mirror to the incident radar poles. And most of the incident radar energy is reflected away from the sensor. So in this case, the radar is on the left and it's uh, looking down, illuminating towards the right. And since the surface is mirror-like, the energy is reflected away from the radar. And so open water surfaces tend to be specular reflectors. They, uh, when they're smooth, they, they tend to um, just uh, scatter the energy away from the radar. And so these areas, open water surfaces, tend to look very dark in radar images. Now, when surface height variations begin to approach the size of the wavelength, then the surface will appear rough. And a rough surface will scatter energy approximately equally in all directions. It will scatter it diffusely, and a portion of that energy will be backscattered to the radar. So an example of this is maybe you have an open water surface, but there are ripples on the water, and they're small ripples. And so remember, the size of the ripples, if they're, um, if they're large enough to uh, be approximately the size of the, uh, the length of the wave, then that surface will appear rough. And so there'll be some rough surface scattering uh, whenever there's uh, ripples over the water. Um, if, if you're looking at, especially with the uh, shorter wavelengths uh, with the C-band and X-band. So you need larger ripples uh, with the longer wavelengths such as L-band for a surface to appear rough. And as the surface becomes rougher, you'll have more energy scattered in different directions, but more of that energy is scattered back to the satellite. So the, the surface will appear even brighter. Now, there's, uh, there's something called volume scattering, and that's when the radar energy is scattered within a volume or a medium. And it usually consists of multiple bounces and reflections from different components within the volume. And you can have volume scattering with this, uh, within a snowpack, for example, or within a vegetation layer. I'll talk uh, further along about uh, volume scattering within the vegetation. And then finally, you've got something called double bounce. And that's when two smooth surfaces form a right angle facing the radar beam. And the beam bounces twice twice off the surfaces, and most of the energy is reflecting back to the radar sensor. And double bounce is commonly seen in urban areas such as high-rise buildings or also in flooded vegetation. The following charts are examples of the different scattering mechanisms discussed in the previous slide, and this example shows specular reflection. So the image on the right is a mosaic of the Amazon basin from the SMAP radar. That was an L-band radar. And the yellow circle delineates an area of specular reflection, which is open water, and it's part of the Amazon River. So flat surfaces, such as paved roads, runways, or calm water, normally appear as dark areas in radar images, 
since most of the incident radar energy is reflected away from the satellite. And this example shows rough surface uh, scattering delineated by ye the yellow circle on this map radar image. And this area is an area of very low to no vegetation. And, and it's an area that has probably been deforested. Agricultural fields with low vegetation, tilled fields, savannas, bare fields, or in general, areas that have low vegetation have surface, have uh, rough surface scattering. And so they tend to be characterized by uh, a very low backscatter. And in this example, we have uh, volume scattering vo delineated by the yellow circle. And this is an area where there's forest. And the intensity of volume scattering depends on the physical properties of the, the volume, such as variations in moisture content and structure as well as the characteristics of the radar, the wavelength, the polarization, and the incidence angle. So in, but in this case, and in, uh, with radar, forested areas tend to have a higher backscatter than areas that are non-forested or areas where there's low vegetation or lower vegetation. So now let's switch a little bit. We've talked about the radar parameters. We've talked about the surface parameters. We talked about the radar signal interaction of the signal with surface components. Uh, we've talked about some of the issues that you need to account for, uh, such as uh, geometric distortions and, and, and speckle. Now let's talk about the radar backscattering in forests and, and uh, what that signal looks like in forest. But let, let's first talk about some of the basics. Um, and this is an example of volume scattering in a forest. So scattering in a forest may come from the leaf canopy at the tops of the trees, the leaves and branches further below, the trees, trunks, and uh, the soil. It, it may serve, um, it, it, volume scattering may decrease or increase image brightness, and that's going to depend on how much of the energy is scattered out of the volume and back to the radar. So this figure illustrates all of the possible scattering mechanisms within a forest. Number one is a direct scattering from tree trunks to a ground, ground scattering to be crown ground scattering, 3A ground trunk scattering, 3B trunk ground scattering, and then four, you've got volume scattering. So these are all the possible combinations. So this example shows double bounds and delineated by the yellow circle on the SMAP radar image. And this is an inundated forest, meaning that the trees are on standing water. And the reason that the signal is so strong is because the, it bounces off the water, which is a specular reflector, onto the tree trunk or other components of the tree and then bounces back to the satellite. And so a large amount of that incoming energy is reflected back to the satellite. And that's why these areas appear very, very bright. Um, and, and so obviously, the, uh, our ability to detect inundated vegetation is dependent on the wavelength. So the longer the wavelength, the higher the probability of detecting these areas, especially in tropical rainforests that are very dense. So you'll have a, uh, the, the longer wavelengths will have greater penetration through the vegetation canopy as opposed to the shorter wavelengths. Now, we cannot measure the amount of standing water, just that there is water above the soil surface. So now I'll discuss the sensor parameters that influence the signal. And for radar, these are structure and dielectric. This is very important. This is the essence of radar. What is radar sensitive to? It's sensitive to structure and it's sensitive to dielectric. So uh, when I talk about dielectric, that means the moisture content of the components in the land surface, whether it's vegetation water content or um, um, moisture in the soil. So backscatter is a function of a target's moisture content and structural characteristics. Remember that. That's, that's critical about radar. And for forests, this means that a, uh, the forest volume, the biomass and, and structural com complexity of the forest, such as a the forest, uh, the, the trunks of the trees, branches, leaves, and their orientation, they can indicate spe uh, specific types of uh, species. Unlike optical imagery, 
If sensor parameters are stable, as in the case with most uh, repeat pass orbiting SAR sensors, the signal variations at any given pixel location are only a function of these target characteristics. Sun angle variations that are seen in optical data do not affect the active SAR system. Also, atmospheric variations, including clouds, have almost no impact on the SAR signal. But there are some, in, uh, there are some exceptions, um, especially at shorter wavelength uh, SARs, when heavy active uh, rain occurs. So as a result, when analyzing radar signals, it's important to recognize that moisture changes in both soil and vegeta vegetation can strongly affect the radar signal. There are three parameters related to structure, size relative to wavelength, size and orientation, and density. Again, the length of the wave will determine how it interacts with surface objects. So size relative to wavelength defines the surface roughness. If, for example, you have wind ripples on the surface of the water that are relative to the wavelength, then that surface will appear rough. Remember that the darker the pixel, the smoother the surface in relation to the wavelength. And as the surface roughness increases, the backscatter intensity will increase. Size and orientation influences the interactions of the waves that are either horizontally or vertically polarized. And then finally, the density of the scatterers and uh, the biomass will influence the strength of the return signal as well as the depth of penetration of the signal. The signal will be stronger when scatterers are closer together. And also, the greater the biomass, the less the penetration through the canopy. This is a function of wavelength. And the greater the density of uh, the scatterers, the less the penetration. If there are gaps in the vegetation canopy, there is a larger likelihood for the signal to penetrate all the way through. Here we have an example of size relative to wavelength. If an object or the surface roughness is the approximate size of a wave, then there'll be interaction and the surface will appear rough and there'll be energy scattered back. If the wavelength is much larger than an object, there'll be no or minimal interaction between the wavelength and the object and the surface will appear smooth. There'll there'll be minimal to, en to no energy scattered back. So backscatter from vegetation is strongly dependent on the size of the scattering elements within the canopy. There's greater response to scatterers which are similar to the size of the wavelength. And this is an example of an Austrian pine. The primary scatterers in a tree canopy are the leaves, the branches, and the stems, and, and the trunks. Their sizes are on the order of the wavelength or larger. Now, you can see that for higher frequencies, such as X-band, which with a wavelength of three centimeters, scattering is dominated by the canopy and by the smaller branches and, and the needles. For lower frequencies, such as L-band, with a wavelength of 27 centimeters, the dominant scattering is, are the primary and secondary branches and stems, but not so much the, the needles. Now, if we go to an even lower frequency, such as P-band, with a wavelength of 70 centimeters in this case, the scattering is dominated by the primary branches and the trunk, and there will be, some, uh, there'll be a contribution from the soil as well. So the longer the wavelength, the greater the sensitivity to uh, the vertical structure of the vegetation. This is an example of size and orientation of the components on the surface. On the left, there are two different leaves. A vertically polarized wave from a shorter wavelength, such as say X-band or C-band, will interact with the vertical components of the leaf, depicted uh, in blue. And a horizontally polarized wave will interact with the horizontal components of the leaf that's depicted in red. So the first leaf has slightly more vertical structure than horizontal structure, and hence the energy scattered back from the vertically polarized wave will be higher than the horizontally polarized wave. And for the second leaf, it's about the same, the vertical and the horizontal structure. So the energy 
scattered back from the vertical and horizontal waves is going to be about the same. The example on the right is the interaction of a longer wavelength, such as L or P-band, with the structure of a tree. And in the first tree, there is a larger interaction of the vertically polarized wave with the trunk and the canopy than with the horizontally polarized wave. For the second tree, there is a larger interaction of the vertically polarized wave with the trunk than the horizontally polarized wave. So also, there's something called depolarization, which is when a uh, signal in one polarization is depolarized into another polarization. So that's when you have HV, for example. So you transmit in horizontal polarization and uh, you receive in a vertical polarization. So this occurs, this depolarization occurs when the signal scatters multiple times within a medium, such as a vegetation canopy. And therefore, the incoming signal um, is vertically polarized, for example, and it's depolarized to a horizontal polarization. And that's, that's when you have um, VH and vice versa. Cross polarization is very sensitive to vegetation parameters. The last surface parameter related to structure to keep in mind is vegetation density. The denser the vegetation, the less likely for the signal to penetrate through the canopy. And of course, this is a function of wavelength. So there's a saturation problem. The signal saturates at a certain biomass level. And, and, and uh, this is wavelength dependent. Obviously, for C-band, it will saturate at a low, lower tonnage, tons per hectare, than at longer wavelengths that penetrate deeper through the vegetation canopy. So at C-band in a boreal forest, um, it'll saturate, the signal will saturate at around 20 tons per hectare, at L-band at around 40 tons per hectare, and at P-band at around 100 tons per hectare. The last surface parameter to discuss is the influence of dielectric or the moisture content in soils and vegetation. Increased moisture content in soils and vegetation tends to increase the backscatter signal. The magnitude of the radar backscatter is proportional to the moisture content of the surface. So for dry, naturally occurring materials, it's in the range of 3 to 8, while for liquid water, it's around 40 to 80. This is also frequency dependent. Therefore, the amount of moisture in the soil or vegetation can greatly influence an increase in radar reflectivity. So for example, surfaces such as soil and vegetation cover will appear brighter when they are wet than when they are dry. And something else to note is that the larger the water content in vegetation or soil, the less the signal penetration into the medium, whether it's uh, through the vegetation canopy or through the soil. This is an example of the impact of an increase in surface moisture on the radar signal. This is a Sentinel-1 C-band image over an area in Ecuador for three different years. And as you can see, in 2017, it looks different than the rest of the images. There are some bright and dark anomalies. And the dark areas are associated with actively rain uh, events, causing uh, just very strong signal attenuation. So in the tropical regions, you have these really intense rain events. And so when you have that kind of activity, there is signal attenuation. Now, the brightening effects that you see are the results of uh, wet vegetation and soils from the rain event. So one last thing I want to discuss are issues that you need to account for with radar images that you need to correct for. And one big issue are geometric distortions due to topography. And these distortions result in relief displacements. And this displacement occurs in areas that are perpendicular to the flight path. So there's foreshortening and there's layover. Layover occurs when the radar beam reaches the top of a tall feature on the left-hand side, you can see, so it reaches B before it reaches the base, A. And the, the return signal from the top of the feature will be received before the signal from the bottom. And as a result, the top of the feature is displaced towards the radar from its true position on the ground. And it, it, so it appears to lay over the base of the feature. 
Layover is most severe for small incidence angles and at the near range of the swath. Foreshortening occurs when the radar beam reaches the base of a tall feature that's tilted towards the radar before it reaches the top. Because the radar measures distance in slant range, um, the slope A to B will appear compressed and the length of the slope will be represented incorrectly. Depending on the angle of the hillside or the, the mountain slope in relation to the incidence angle of the radar beam, the severity of foreshortening will vary. Maximum foreshortening occurs when the radar beam is perpendicular to the slope such that the, um, the slope, the base, and the top are imaged simultaneously. Now you can correct for these uh, using software that's uh, usually already included in uh, open source uh, uh, software that's available. So SNAP, for example, has tools to correct for these geometric distortions and it uses a digital elevation model to correct for these things. Another issue to account for is radar shadow and that occurs when the radar beam is not able to illuminate the ground surface. This also occurs in areas with complex topography. So shadows occur behind vertical features or slopes with steep sides. And since the radar beam just simply does not illuminate the surface, shadowed regions will appear dark on an image as there was no energy available to be backscattered. As the incidence angle increases from near to far range, so will the shadow effects as the radar beam looks more and more bleakly at the surface. So this image illustrates radar shadow effects on the right side of the hillsides, which are being illuminated from the left. There are ways to correct for shadows through interpolation. However, I personally prefer to leave the shadow areas as areas of data gaps rather than use interpolated values. So one last aspect to discuss is speckle, and that's that grainy salt and pepper texture in an image. And this is caused by random constructive and destructive interference from multiple scattering returns that occur within each resolution cell. So for example, there's a homogeneous target such as a large grass covered field. Without the effect of speckle, it would generally result in a light tone uh, pixel values in an image. However, with radar, there, the, the, there are multiple reflections within each resolution cell from individual blades of grass. And so um, that's why, uh, and, and the individual blades of grass are not exactly in the same orientation. They don't have exactly the same size, etc. They differ in characteristics from um, uh, a pixel resolution cell to pixel resolution cell. And that's why you end up with these images where you have pixels that appear slightly brighter and darker than, than, uh, than others. So the issue with speckle is that when it comes time to classifying, the classifier will actually pick up that noise. Uh, it will be reflected in your final classification. So one thing to remember about radar images is that the resolution that is stated for the radar image is not the actual resolution that you'll be deriving a product from. And the reason for that is say a, a radar image uh, is 10 meters, right? So you'll, you, you need to, or you wanna apply a speckle filter in order to remove that, that speckle or not remove it, you'll never remove it, but you'll reduce the speckle with a speckle filter. However, the issue about a speckle filter is that you will reduce the actual resolution of the image. So whenever you apply a speckle filter, you are reducing the resolution of the image. And that totally depends on how big the filter is. So basically what you're doing is you take a box and uh, it, it can be a three by three or five by five box and you move it over each pixel in the image, applying a mathematical calculation using the pixel values in that window and then you replace the central pixel with the new value. And so that window is moved along in both the row and column dimensions, one pixel at a time, until your entire image has been covered. So, so that's why um, the, the bigger that uh, window, that speckle filtering window, the greater the resolution loss. That's just gonna be 
uh, something that you all you need to account for whenever you're running a classification using radar images. This is a Pulsar image from the Japanese satellite ALOS. It's an L-band image acquired near the city of Altamira, Brazil, in December of 2010. And the idea here is to show you the backscatter characteristics in forested and deforested areas, or areas with low vegetation. So in forested areas, the dominant scattering mechanism is volume scattering. And that means that the cross-polarized signals such as HV or VH will have a higher return than the polarized, co-polarized signals such as VV or HH. So in deforested areas, there is a change from volume to surface scattering. This means that the cross-polarized backscatter will decrease significantly. There are exceptions to this though. So for example, if deforestation results in rough soil conditions, or if the soils are rough because of tilling, for example, then backscatter can be enhanced. However, in a time series analysis, the trends um, usually indicate a reduction in backscatter in areas that are deforested. Now, for a shorter wavelength, such as C-band, soil moisture condition can have an effect on the signal. It can enhance the signal and introduce some ambiguities. And the time series signals will re reveal these ambiguities. Uh, forest degradation, uh, that usually results in decreased volume scattering, but there might be some contribution from the soil. And uh, this depends on the level of degradation. At C-band, degradation is difficult to detect unless there are large parches, patches of forest that have been removed. At L-band, these trends uh, tend to be um, much uh, better characterized. So there's a, a detectable signal drop from forest thinning or degradation. Uh, so the type of degradation also determines the scattering mechanisms. For example, if there's a fire event, there's a strong increase in L-band because there is a stronger soil contribution, which will enhance the double bounce and increase the uh, backscatter. This is an example, this is a zoomed in area of the previous image. And I wanted to show you this because it shows different gray level tones in the image. And so you can appreciate here that there are areas that are very dark, they're black. And these areas are probably areas that have been deforested, that they're bare or there's very, very low vegetation. And there are uh, tones that are higher, uh, so there's higher backscatter, and those areas represent some level of vegetation. So the higher the back, backscatter, the greater the level of vegetation in this area. So if you're interested in looking at inundated vegetation, as discussed previously, these areas are very bright because they're dominated by double bounce. And so this is what it looks like. All of these very bright areas are areas where there's inundation, there's standing water underneath the vegetation. So this is a very nice table that summarizes the expected backscatter response to different types of vegetation at two different bands, at C-band and L-band. So you can get a freely available C-band and L-band data. And at, uh, the C-band data is VV and VH, that's from Sentinel-1. And the L-band data that's available is from Pulsar, and that's at HH and HV. And then um, what, uh, th this is coming from the SAR Handbook Chapter 2 by Josef Kellendorfer. And what he did was, um, uh, basically summarize the signal response for different types of forests, uh, dry forest and flooded forest. So sparse forest, degraded forest, and dense forest under both dry and inundated conditions. So this is an example of multiple dates for vegetation studies. Uh, this is a Pulsar HV image uh, for an uh, area in Brazil uh, called Rondonia. And what we've done here has, is uh, we've taken 
images from different years over the same areas, so 2007, 2008, and 2010. And we've created an RGB, which is on the top. So these are all HV images. And the image on the red channel is 2007, image in the green channel is 2008, and the image in the blue channel is 2010. And so that color circle helps you understand how to interpret that RGB image, how to interpret that change um, in the different years. So red, for example, means that uh, the backscatter was high in 2007, but low in 2008 and 2010. That means that there was forest in 2007 and it was cleared by 2008 and it continued to be clear by 2010. An area that's yellow, for example, means that it was high in 2007 uh, seven and 2008, but low in 2010. So that means that there was forest in 2007 and 2008, and it was cleared in 2010. Uh, another, let's pick a cyan, so that's a combination of green and blue. That means that it was high in 2008 and 2010, but low in 2007. So that means there was a low vegetation in 2007 or it was clear or barren in 2007. And then there was a regrowth in 2008, uh, which uh, continued in 2010. So there are several sources of confusion when running land cover classifications with radar images. And one of them is open water and low vegetation. Both are characterized as smooth surfaces and they can be hard to distinguish. Usually uh, areas that are barren or have very low vegetation tend to have some level of roughness and slightly higher backscatter than a completely smooth specular surface such as a calm open water body. However, sometimes water surfaces can have roughness because of wind and that results with, in, in some level of confusion between low vegetated areas or barren areas and open water. And so you can see that in these images. The, these are images from Pausar El Band near Manaus, Brazil. And the HH image, uh, you can see there is some roughness on the water and you can clearly see that in the HH and VV image. With HV images, um, the water tends to be very dark because the signal doesn't depolarize in, in, uh, uh, in areas where there's a low roughness or uh, such as water. And, and so you can see that there is um, the same level of backscatter intensity between the open water areas and the areas that have low or no vegetation north of the river. Another source of confusion are areas that are characterized by double bounds, and these are flooded areas and urban areas. And in this image, the city of Manaus in Brazil is circled in red. Uh, this is a very large urban area, and as you can clearly see, it's characterized by very bright backscatter. Uh, so you can see, also see that there's flooded vegetation along the rivers, and uh, both of these areas, the urban area and the flooded vegetation, are just very bright. They, they're both dominated by uh, double bounce. A final source of confusion are areas where there's complex topography. And as you can see in this image, these areas tend to have high backscatter. And uh, this uh, can be confused with inundated vegetation. So in terms of radar data available, here we have a list of legacy, current, and future SAR data sets available. The ones that have a green box around them are data sets that can be downloaded for free. Uh, so there's CSAT. It was an L-band SAR sensor that flew for a couple months in 1978. And there's ALOS-1, which is a Japanese satellite that had a SAR sensor, L-band sensor called PALSAR that flew in the 2000s. Uh, also ERS-1 and ERS-2, which is a C-band SAR sensor from the European Space Agency. Some of that data can be freely available through the Alaska Satellite Facility. In terms of current data sets, the only uh, current operational data set that is freely available is Sentinel-1, which is a C-band sensor from the European Space Agency. And it started collecting data since 2014. 
So this data set is not only available through the Alaska Satellite Facility, but also through the European Space Agency's Copernicus Hub. In terms of future, there's uh, the NISAR satellite mission, which is a joint NASA and Indian Space Agency uh, satellite mission that will have an L and S band SAR sensors. And there's also biomass at around the same time, and that is a satellite um, mission SAR, SAR that will be launched, at, that is um, from the European Space Agency, and it will have a P-band sensor. So the NISAR mission, uh, a very exciting mission uh, because it has an L-band and an S-band sensor. Uh, again, it will be launched uh, around the 2022 timeframe. It will have 12-day uh, temporal repeats. The, the data will be made available, uh, freely available. The resolution will vary depending on the mode, but it will be somewhere between 3 and 10 meters. So that concludes the theoretical part, and the next part will be focused on a demo and a time series analysis of Sentinel-1 SAR data using Google Earth Engine. The exercise overview consists in visualizing the Sentinel-1 data, selecting an area of interest to run the analysis, and the area of interest will be in, in the Amazon. Uh, we'll load the images from multiple dates, in this case 2016, 2018, and 2019. And we'll apply a filter on the SAR images to reduce the speckle. And then we'll calculate differences in forest cover between 2016 and 2018, and then between 2018 and 2019. We'll apply a threshold and we'll compare the changes in forest cover through time. Google Earth Engine is a great resource. It's, cloud, it's a cloud-based geospatial processing platform, and it's available to scientists, researchers, and developers for analysis of Earth's surface. It's uh, free to sign up for an account. You do need to have an account in, a, in, a, in order to uh, use it. And it contains a catalog of satellite imagery and geospatial data sets, including Sentinel-1, so it's got the entire Sentinel-1 SAR database. And it uses a, a JavaScript code editor. And once you have an account, then this is what the Google Earth Engine code editor looks like. And you can see that there are different uh, windows in this interface. You've got the actual code editor. You can uh, save it. You can search for data sets. There's a help button, uh, task manager. There are many different options as explained here. We'll be using Sentinel-1 data. Uh, it's a satellite. Sentinel-1 is a satellite from the European Space Agency. It operates at C-band and it has global coverage every 12 days. So there are actually two satellites, A and B. And between the two of them, you have coverage every six days over the equator. However, uh, their acquisitions with both satellites are primarily focused over Europe and the rest of the world there there is acquisition over some places but usually for the rest of the world it's just uh, with one of the satellites. In terms of modes it operates at different modes but the one that you want to work with is the interferometric wide swath data. So that's the routine collection over land. If you go to the following link, you can access a page that has a description of the Sentinel-1 catalog. It explains the different modes of images that are housed on Google Earth Engine as, as described in the previous slide. All of the images are in GRD, that means they're uh, in the ground range projection. And depending on the mode, they might come in different polarizations as well as resolutions. The processing that has been applied to the images has been using the Sentinel toolbox and they have um, applied the thermal noise removal. They've applied the radiometric calibration as well as the terrain correction. So these images are 
basically ready to be used for analysis. The only thing you might need to do is to apply a speckle filter and actually we'll do that as part of this demo. Our focus area is in the state of Rondonia in Brazil and in some areas within the state there's been some vegetation loss to either agriculture or to uh, grazing. So we'll focus on a specific area and we'll look at a time span of four years to, to see how things have changed. So let's get started. The first thing we want to do is visualize the Sentinel-1 data. And let's uh, start by opening up Google Earth Engine through the link provided here. So go to the code editor uh, in Google Earth Engine. And so here we are in Google Earth Engine, and you'll do a search for Sentinel-1 data. So if you click there, a window pops up that has a description of the Sentinel-1 data that's housed on Google Earth Engine. And one thing that's important is that this data is really, it's analysis ready. So uh, Google Earth Engine has applied a thermal noise removal, radiometric calibration, and terrain correction. And one thing to note is that all the images are in dB, so that's log power. So if you want more information about each of the images, image properties, uh, terms of use, you can close up and uh, click on those. All right, so uh, let's... Now, the first thing we want to do is define our area of interest. And in order to define our area of interest, you go to the top left, and there's an icon there for defining a, a line. And we will here select this line. So let me more space here. Select this line. It says draw a line. And we'll zoom into the state of Rondonia. We'll kind of draw a line here uh, around. This is more or less our area of interest. And right there. Now, what you want to do is go ahead and rename that to call it ROI for region of interest and press OK. All right, so that defines our area of interest. And then next, we will um, load the Sentinel data and then we'll filter for images that are interferometric wide swath mode. So those are the ones we want. That's, those are the images that have been acquired um, over land that we're interested in, the IW. We want the descending pass, 10 meter resolution, and VV polarization. So let's just copy this code here. And we'll go ahead and we'll paste. So for some reason, this should look like this. All right. So then we will do the same thing. So this is for VV, but we also want VH images. So we will uh, do the same thing for VH. We copy this code. The code is the same. It has the same. Uh, filters. So we're filtering through the Sentinel-1 uh, database, uh, which is this one, Copernicus S1 GRD, and uh, instrument mode IW, VH polarization, descending 10 meters, and we're filtering. So we're doing our selection within the area of interest that we defined. Okay. And then we select the VH images and we print that into the collection VH. So let's go back and
All right, so let's hit run. So if you open this up, this is telling us that it found 816 images, VV images, uh, that cover our area of interest and 812 VH. So now those are the images throughout the time period that Sentinel has been collecting data. Now let's filter according to date and we will Uh, we will identify three different date ranges. So we copy this text and paste it in line 21. And so what this does is we are um, identifying images that fall or touch this area, fall somewhere within this area um, that between 2016, August of 1st, 2016 to August 10th, 2016, August 5th through August 10th, 2018, and August 1st through 2000, uh, uh, through August 15th, 2019. So we are identifying, we're creating a, a, a mosaic of uh, uh, the image that cover that time period in 2016, 2018, and 2019. Okay, so we want all of the images to uh, cover m the area more or less during the same month, months, or the same time period. Okay. So, go back and now what we do is uh, we're filtering according to date, but the next thing you need to do is you need to add those images to, to the layers in order to be able to visualize the layers. So let's just copy this text and paste. So what this does is it adds the images that were identified for the different dates in both BV and VH. It adds them to, um, uh, to layers, okay? So let's just save this right now. And run it. Okay, so you've got up here in the upper right, you've got a, a layers um, icon, and these are the images that we've identified. So let's just bring up the image. It's 2016, 2018. So let's zoom in a little bit to, to see details of the images. Two thousand nineteen. And the cool thing about the Google Earth is that you can kind of toggle, you can either toggle back and forth or you can fade the images in and out by grabbing this bar here and just fading things in and out. So what we're seeing, what I've overlaid is 2019 over 2016. And let's just toggle this to see any changes. So we do see changes. Now remember from the theoretical part that the dark areas are areas that, that have uh, either no cover, they're bare, or they're uh, they have very, very low vegetation. So you see some really dark areas 
here. And then you have different levels of gray, which represent different levels of vegetation. So the brighter the gray tone, that means the higher the vegetation. And you can see, for example, so, so that's 2016 and I'm overlaying 2019. And you can see, for example, this area right here, you can see that uh, there's been some vegetation loss in this area and this area here. So let's do that again so you can see it. See, there's vegetation loss. And a lot of times what happens is that these plots are, are cleared and then they're just uh, uh, abandoned or not used. And so you've got vegetation growing back and then they're cleared again. So a lot of times you can see the patterns. In fact, you can kind of see these old patterns. So it was, you can see, barely see some edges here. Um, and so a lot of these, it, it's been some clearing and the vegetation has grown back. Uh, and then they're, uh, they're cleared again. Okay, so let's just deselect that. One thing to keep in mind is that these images are not speckle filtered. So the Sentinel-1 images, are, they've, been, um, they've been processed, they've been radiometrically corrected, they've been uh, terrain corrected, but they have not been speckle filtered. So the next thing we wanna do is we wanna apply a speckle filter. However, before that, actually, I jumped over a step. One thing I wanted to show you is um, the RGB that uh, I've created here. So when you added the layers to it, the images to the, the layers here, um, I also included an RGB of the three different dates. And so remember that color wheel in the theoretical part, so that will help you interpret this image. In the red channel, there's the 2016 image. In the green channel, there's the 2018 image. And in the blue channel, there's the 2019 image. So you can see a, a lot of change in this area. There's a, a lot to interpret here from the different colors. Now, if something is green, that means it was high in 2018 but low in 2016 and 2019. So if so something is red, for example, that means it was high in 2016 because the 2016 image is in the red channel. So everything, so the red channel is brighter than the green channel, whatever's in the green channel and whatever is in the blue channel. And so that means there was probably, there was some level of vegetation in 2016 and it was cleared in 2018 and it continued to be cleared in 2019. So you have a whole lot of different combinations here, different colors uh, that you can then go back and uh, look at that color wheel to help interpret. Anything that's yellow, remember yellow is a combination between red and green. And so anything that is yellow means that whatever's in the red channel and whatever's in the green channel is high, and then whatever's in the blue channel is low, okay? So there was vegetation there in 2016, 2018, and in 2019, it was, it was uh, cleared. Okay, so a lot of variability here. Okay, so that's just one way to uh, just get a feel for the variability in your images and the change um, within the within this time frame. Okay, so now now let's go back and let's go to the next step, which is to apply a, a speckle filter. So let's just copy this. code here and go back and paste it. So we're on line 39 now. All right. So what this does is 
uh, we'll apply a speckle filter to uh, to reduce that graininess. And at this level, it doesn't really show, it's not really apparent. But if you zoom in, uh, you can see it. And it'll be even more apparent after we run the speckle filter and we do the comparisons. So let's go ahead and run it. We copy the code and we run the filter, which is just a smoothing filter. And And the next thing we want to do is we want to add the filtered uh, uh, images to the layers, okay? So in order to do that, we copy this code. Again, what this is doing is it, it's just indicating to add to the layers and you're specifying which images you want to add to the layers. And then you want to stretch the images according to the, the values within the image. So uh, in this case, I'm setting that stretch, that histogram stretch from minus 15 to zero, okay? And this is what I'm calling the image. Um, this one, the first one, 2016 VV filter. All right, so let's go back and let's copy that. All right, so now let's save and let's run the code and this is now going to result in having the not only the original images added uh, included in under layers but also the filtered images okay the speckle filtered images so here we have the original images we have the rgb and then here we have the filtered images now let's just select 2016 VH and the 2016 VH filter. So we can uh, take a look at the, the difference between the two. So let's just zoom in. All right. So this is the original image. And this is the filtered image. Now you will lose, lose some resolution whenever you apply the speckle filters. That is the trade off that you will lose some spatial resolution. But that uh, is at the expense of uh, having a cleaner classification because in the end that that graininess will translate into your classification results so so this is what it looks like okay and the larger the speckle filter the greater the, the spatial resolution loss so the filtered image is the same on the same grid but you you have a, a spatial resolution loss even though it's the same grid as the original resolution all right. So what we want to do is we want to work with the speckle filtered images. Now, one thing uh, you can do in order to get a sense for the values is if you go up here to inspector on the top right, select inspector, anywhere you click. So let's say, let's just click here. It'll give you the pixel value for all of the different um, bands or images that you have listed here under layers, okay? So that gives you a sense of what the values are and you can click around and get a sense on how the values differ between different gray level areas and the brighter toned areas and the very, very dark areas. All right. So let's keep going with our exercise here. So here we have an example in the PowerPoint of uh, what the image looks like when it's filtered versus not filtered. 
we just saw that. Now the thing, the next thing we want to do is create a, the difference, calculate the difference between before and after. And so this exercise is based on thresholding. There, there are different ways of doing time series analysis. Uh, here we selected a simple thresholding, which you do between two images. So what we've done has been to select the difference or calculate the difference between 2016 and 2018 and then between 2018 and 2019. So we'll copy this code. And what this code does, it's, it's just a simple difference. Now, you'll note that uh, there's the word here, subtract, rather than divide. And the reason for that is because when you're performing a, 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 a ratio with values that are in log scale, so in this case, the, the values the backscatter values are in dB, they're in log scale. Uh, what you need to do is, is um, to subtract the values. So that is equivalent to dividing two log numbers, okay? So we copy this, then we go back, we paste it on. And we also want to then add the different images that we calculate onto the layers. So. All right, so here we're calculating the difference between uh, before and after for 2016 and 2018 for VH and VV. And then here we're calculating the difference between 2018 and 2019 for VH and VV. All right, and then down here, we're adding those difference images, which I've called difference between 16, 2016, 2018, VH, and, and so on. Um, so we add those different images to the layers over here. All right, and uh, this is the stretch that we're applying in order to visualize it, and then this is what we're calling each of the images. So what appears under layers is this name. That's the identifier. So let's just save that, and we will run. Okay, so we've got the difference images. Let's take a look at the difference images. So let's display the 2016-2018, and uh, let's just zoom in. So the areas that are bright are areas where there's been loss in vegetation uh, between uh, from 2016 to 2018. So there was vegetation there in 2016 and it was lost in 2018. Now the areas that are dark means that it was cleared there or there was low vegetation in 2016, but there was some sort of vegetation regrowth in 2018. Now, if you wanna take a closer look at those things, this is the difference image, but let's just bring up the actual image, okay? So the actual images. So let's just focus on this area here. Let me zoom in. So this area, there was a vegetation regrowth in 2018, okay? And in this area, there was vegetation loss in 2018. So let's bring up the 2016 and 2018. So there you can see, okay, so in, this is 2016, you see this area is quite dark. Uh, so that means there was low 
either it was barren or very low vegetation. And this area has a, a higher backscatter. That means there's some level of vegetation there. And let's just bring the 2018. Okay. So there was vegetation regrowth within this area. And there was vegetation loss within this area, which is what the difference is indicating. All right, so that's how you interpret that. That's just to give you a feel on how, what the values mean. So let's move on here. The next part includes selecting a new re uh, region of interest. So let's just focus on the region of interest for which these different maps have been generated. And the reason I'm doing that, so take a look. These different maps, they cover the same area. And you can clearly see, by the way, if you toggle back and forth, that there's been a, a, quite a bit of vegetation loss in between 2018 and 2019 in this area up here, over here. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to select an area, and the reason for that is because there are some issues here with the borders, and you, you, get, you see these dark areas. So what we want to do is when we do a comparison, and a statistical comparison of the change between the images, we want to kind of exclude those areas that bring in uh, these, these errors due to those artifacts. So let's just define a new area. So to do that, we go and we select, we, we follow the same process as before, just select the draw line icon here. And under geometry import, select new layer. And we'll just draw a new line here, right here. Great, and we call that, let's call it new region of interest, all right? Let's make it clear. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is we wanna create a histogram to see the distribution of these different values. Um, of the values within the difference images. So let's just copy this code. And what this does is we are creating an, a histogram from, in this case, we're just taking the VH images. Uh, so we're taking the difference between 2016 and 18 VH image, and we're creating a histogram for that region that's called, that we just uh, identified as new ROI. And we're doing the same thing for the 2018, 2019. So let's copy and go back. Okay, and let's just run this. And what this will do is it will show the histograms here on the console window. And what you need to do is you click on the upper right, there's an arrow right here. So you click on that and a new window will pop up with your histogram. So this is 2016, 2018. That gives you an idea of the distribution of those different difference values. So we know that the negative ones are areas where there's been um, uh, regrowth, and the uh, positive ones are areas where there's been vegetation loss. All right, and so we can see that uh, it's it's kind of the middle is around 0.12. Zero point one three, and then we go back. So let's close this window. Nope. 
And then you can visualize the other one too. This is 2018, 2019, slightly different distributional values. Um, with this, so there's, uh, there's more vegetation loss that occurred between 2018, 2019, then 2016, 19. You can see that in this, in this, uh, the tail here of this histogram. So let's close this window and just make sure you save your code. And then the next thing we want to do is calculate some statistics for the histogram. So remember, we're going to apply a threshold. So let's just get a, a, some statistics on the mean and standard deviation. So let's uh, copy this code. The first thing you want to do is since we want to calculate uh, two statistics, we first we combine the two statistics that we want to calculate into a variable called reducers. Okay, so that contains, it's telling it that reducers contains the mean and the standard deviation. So let's copy that. So we've created reducers and then let's apply those statistics to our images. Okay, so what we're doing is we are saying we're creating this variable called stats1618 which it takes the difference image from 2016-2018 VH. We're just working with VH here. And we're saying, okay, apply the stats that we define in the variable reducer. So that's mean and standard deviation. Um, if, if you just wanted to do one, you, do, you don't really have to go through this step up here. You can just say EE reducer dot mean if that's what you just wanted to calculate and you just put that here. Okay, in this case, since we're doing two, we combined it. Uh, geometry, so we want these stats to be calculated for the area, that new region of interest that we outline, um, and then the scale, and then we do the same thing for the 18, 2018, 2019. And then what we wanna do is we wanna print those statistics. And so to do that, just copy this code and paste it. So what this will do is it will, it will print the statistics in the console. So let's just save this and run it. Okay, so what it does is it prints out the stats. So we've got the statistics here for the 2016-2018. So we've got the mean and the standard deviation of that difference image. And then we've got the statistics for the 2018-2019. So what we want to do is apply the threshold based on values that are 1.5 the standard deviation and above. All right, so let's just copy this code and paste it. All right, so let's paste it. Now, one thing to note is in the exercises, I, I had defined this region of interest was a little different. Okay, so we need to recalculate these thresholds. Um, so what you do is you multiply the standard deviation times 1.5 and you add 0 0.15 okay so that would be 2.13 and then for the first one and it would be 2.81 for the second one 
Okay, so the next thing you want to do is we're creating these masks. Okay, so what you're saying is anything that's above this value in the 2016-2018 difference mask, uh, set it to one. And any, anything that's above this value in the 2018-2019 then set it to one. And that represents vegetation loss. So we want to add that mask that we've created to the layers. Okay. Again, we display mask, map at layer. So we add the difference 2016-18 VH threshold it to the layers. And we call it this, and we are setting a color to it, in this case, red. So let's save and run. All right, so this is our vegetation loss layer. And now let's take a look. Let's zoom in. Uh, there are quite a number of issues along the river. I think the, the best thing to do with the river is to just mask it out. But let's take a look at this area here and let's just bring up the 2018 image okay now you can play around with this filter to change that It's to, to change that value from higher to lower or lower. So let's take a look. This is 2018. And let's take a look at the 2016. Let's deselect that. So let's take a look at this area here. So the dark areas are the areas where there's been vegetation loss. That's all we're identifying with this mask. Okay, so let's All right. Now, the next thing we do is we've overlaid it and Let's compare the vegetation loss between the two time periods. Now, one thing that I didn't do, let me just do that very quickly here, is to bring up the 2018-2019. So there's been, you can see more vegetation loss in 2019. And to visualize that a little better, Let's just change the color for the 2018-2019 vegetation loss. So let's just click on the cog wheel and then here under color, just select, let's select a color that's easily differentiated. Let's just select black. All right. There. So you can see that there was much more loss 2018-2019 than 2016-2018. Okay, so what we want to do is now we want to run some statistics and uh, determine the area where there's been vegetation loss between these two time periods. So let's just, rather than selecting, running our statistics on, on the entire area here, let's just run the statistics over a, a small area. Okay, so let's just, um, let's select an area and what we'll do is you select the polygon, the draw shape, 
icon up here and then select new layer. Okay, and let's call that new layer stats area. So we're calculating statistics over the area that we'll define. So let's just draw a box. Okay, so the statistics on vegetation loss between the two time frames are being calculated only over this area. All right. So what you do is then you copy this code, right? So what this is doing is this code is taking that first image, that 2016-2018 uh, mask, actually, uh, where we applied the threshold, and we are now counting the pixels where there is vegetation loss. So it's saying, what, what is the, the total number of pixels within that area where, um, that we've marked in the mask as er an area where there's been vegetation loss? So we do that for both of the images, and then we print out the stats. Okay, so let's just uh, save and we run it. And what this is saying is that there are 435,000 pixels within that area that we define where there's been vegetation loss to, for 2016-2018 period, and then 631,000 for the 2018-2019 period. Now, the pixel resolution is 10 meters 10 by 10, which is point, uh, 0 0.01 hectares. So if we wanted to convert that to um, hectares, we would just multiply that times 0 0.01, which is 4,350 hectares within that area selected for the first time period and 6,300 11 hectares for the second time period, okay? And even if you overlay these, you can see that there's, uh, there's a, a greater vegetation loss in the second time period, right? So that's 2016-2018, and that's 2018-2019. All right. So, um, Make sure you save your code. And I've got some slides here in the PowerPoint package that show some of the comparisons that we've seen between different years in terms of vegetation loss. Um, and so in summary, in this demo, we've identified Sentinel-1 images for three different years, and we've applied a threshold uh, to create a mask of the areas where there's been vegetation loss. Now, when I mean vegetation loss, it doesn't necessarily mean complete deforestation. It could have been that there was um, some sort of vegetation degradation from one uh, year to another. The, and, and what we've calculated here has just been vegetation loss, but you can also apply to threshold on the other end where there's been regrowth. If you wanna identify areas where there's been uh, maybe some fields have been abandoned and the vegetation has come back. You can also do that. Okay, the threshold that we applied was the standard deviation times 1.5, but uh, you can play around with this value and just uh, apply a, a higher threshold or a lower threshold. Okay, and finally, we made a, did a, a comparison in area where there was vegetation loss between these two periods. Okay, so that concludes our demo. If you have any questions, you can contact either uh, me or Amber, Dr. Amber McCollum or Dr. Juan Torres Perez. Our emails are here. 
for general inquiries on RSET, you can contact Dr. Prados. And you can also visit our RSET website to uh, keep uh, to, to download the recordings or to um, uh, see what sort of future trainings are coming. So the next uh, session uh, that would be next Thursday will be on using SAR and optical images for doing land cover classification. Now let's start the Q&A session. Please type in your questions in the Q&A box. We might not be able to get to all the questions, so we will be answering as many as we can in the time period given. And whatever we can't answer, we will be posting answers to your questions on the RCEP page. Thank you very much. Great, so thank you everyone for attending this session. We are now gonna be answering the questions that you've posted and please, um, if any additional questions, just type them in the chat box. So before we uh, begin, I would like to give a special thanks for the uh, uh, guidance in uh, the Google Earth Engine code to John Dilger, Zachary Bankston, and Gina Kova. Okay, so let's get started. Let's get started here with question number one. I'm quite confused between radar and microwave. Is it the same? So when we talk about microwave, we talk about um, a, a given range in the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So there are sensors that can um, measure at, at within that microwave range. They operate within the microwave range. So there are different sensors that operate within the microwave range. And one of them is uh, radar. So, and synthetic aperture radar is a spe specific one. Okay, so there are active sensors and there are passive sensors that operate within the microwave range. Um, so radar is active and synthetic aperture radar is an active uh, sent. It's a, a radar that operates within the microwave range. Okay, why are X and C bands good for agriculture? Is it because of their wavelengths? That is correct. Since the wavelength is shorter, there's greater interaction with the vegetation. So you get more information about the vegetation, leaf area index, things like that, than the longer wavelengths, which tend to penetrate um, uh, further through the canopy. So with something like L band or P band, you're not really getting that much information about the, the vegetation volume, uh, but you're also you're getting a, quite a a large portion of that signal is relevant to the soil as well with the longer wavelengths. Is there any reason for naming X and C? <laughs> yeah, yes and no. Yes, uh, the reason is that these were codes that came that um, that that were assigned um, during the early days of radar development. This was during World War II. So it was um, actually military. And so in order for security reasons, they came up with this code, which is why it doesn't make sense. It's not in alphabetical order. OK, so why HH polarization penetrates more than other polarizations? So we saw about the interaction of the signal with vertical structure and horizontal structure. So HH tends to penetrate further in general uh, yeah, because there's uh, less attenuation from the vertical structure. Is there a relation between say roughness and backscatter? 
given fixed dielectric like seawater, absolutely. There is a super strong relationship between roughness and backscatter. So the greater the, the roughness in relation to the wavelength, of course, then the, the higher the, the backscatter. So backscatter will tend to increase with surface roughness. Where can I download the SMAP radar mosaic of the Amazon? Uh, you, th so uh, the SMAP radar mosaic is not something that you can download, but you can download SMAP radar data from the Alaska Satellite Facility. And uh, you do need to do some processing to it and then assemble it in order to create these mosaics. And there are only about three months of SMAP radar data. Um, it, it is global, so it's it's actually quite a nice data set. It's L-band, HH, and I believe HV as well. Is double bounce interaction radar good for analyzing flooded forests? Actually, it's excellent. That's why uh, radar is that's one of the strengths uh, in, with radar, especially at the longer wavelengths, is to look at flooded forests because that signal is so distinctive. Flooded forests are characterized um, by having double bounce, and so they appear very bright, very high backscatter in the images. And so radar really is is uh, is a very unique data set for studying flooded forests. Is P-band useful to monitor moistened land surface? So I am assuming that means the, moist, the, the moisture in the soil. And yes, it definitely is. So remember, the longer the wavelength, the greater the penetration through the medium. Now I'm talking about a medium. It could be a, a, a vegetation medium, right? a vegetation canopy. It could be snow, uh, it could be soil. And so with P-band, uh, you can have an assessment or an estimation of soil moisture deeper than with L-band or C-band or X-band. So do keep in mind that the moisture of the surface, the less the penetration, okay? So P-band will, uh, penetrate further, but overall, in general, the wetter the surface, the less the penetration. The, the higher the moisture content in the surface, the less the penetration. Can you overcome the problem of near and far range in the images regarding classification, taking control points from both sides for the same class exactly? Yes. So that is one way you overcome that problem is, um, is if you're uh, training, say you have, uh, let's just say a forest class, right? That class will, uh, depending on the incidence angle range, if it's, it's a, a very large range, that class will probably look very different on the near range versus the far range. So what I would do is I would select training classes for forest area in the near range, and I'll call it, just call it forest near range, and then select another training class for forest in the far range and call it forest far range, okay? Because the, as you saw, that forest, the statistics for those training classes can be several dB different, even though it's the same uh, land cover class. Can DEM be used to correct the shadow effect? Uh, there are ways, yes, to correct the shadow effect through interpolation. I'm, I haven't personally found um, that there, there's, there are always some issues with these interpolations. Uh, sometimes they're like the, these, uh, these transitions that are odd. And so I tend to just uh, create a mask for the areas where there's shadow and just treat that as, as, as no data, basically. What is saturation of the signal? 
So that means, um, as you probably saw in, in those graphs, this, this biomass, that means that um, the, the signal really doesn't, is not changing, that the magnitude of the signal is not changing according to the biomass, the, the density of the vegetation. So that signal just saturates. So usually you can get an you can get an assessment of the the biomass, the bulk density of the vegetation because that signal is penetrating through the vegetation. But at a certain level of biomass, uh, you can no longer see the difference, and that's where that's what um, we mean in in terms of saturation. Can a machine learning algorithm be used for speckle filtering to minimize the resolution loss? That's a good point. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd have to take a look at the literature. Uh, traditionally, what's used are speckle filters. And there's always that trade-off, as I mentioned, in terms of um, uh, losing your spatial resolution with a speckle filter. And obviously the larger the window that you define, the greater the resolution, the spatial resolution loss. You can also do a time series kind of averaging and there you will not lose um, uh, resolution. Is it possible to composite H, 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 V, H, H polarization in one, one image? Yeah, of course. I I think I might have shown an example of that. You can composite any way you want, actually. Uh, it's just really, the important thing is knowing what you're putting in each of your channels, in your RGB channels, and knowing how to interpret those colors. So sometimes it can be confusing, and it's always good to have that color wheel um, in order to uh, be able to interpret the colors, especially you. Know, um, the, the mixing of colors, but you can you can do however you want H H H V. You can do H H H V, and then have a ratio H H H V ratio in the in the blue channel, uh, and and it's a, a matter of uh, just trying different things out. Kindly explain more on the multi-temporal pulsar vegetation. RGB color meaning. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. I'm not sure. Uh, exactly what that what specific part of it uh, you would like to know. So the, the bottom line is we put three different dates in the RGB channels, right? So in the RGB image, whatever appears as red, for example, if there's something that's predominantly red, that means whatever you put in the red channel, whatever image you put in the red channel, the backscatter was higher than um, uh, um, for the image in the red channel than the backscatter in the green and blue channels, okay? So in, case, in, in the case of looking at vegetation loss, that means that if we put the earliest image in the red channel, that means that the vegetation was high, there was some level of vegetation in that area in 2016, and that vegetation was cleared in 2018 and 2019. So it's low backscatter 2018-19. Remember, the lower the vegetation barren, the, the lower the backscatter, right? Um, now, if you have a combination of colors, so say an area is green, we know that green is, uh, I'm sorry, um, if it's, if it's a pink, for example, we know that pink is the combination of red and blue. So that means that whatever you put in the red channel and whatever you put in the blue channel is high. 
and whatever is in the green channel is low, okay? So that means there was vegetation there in that area in 2016 in the red channel. In 2018, whatever is in the green channel, that vegetation was cleared. And by 2019, there was some sort of vegetation growth, some regrowth. And so it was bright again. So it was bright, low, bright in order for that area to appear pink. So that's how you interpret the colors when you have a time series. And that guide, that table that I placed in the PowerPoint uh, is a really good guide to understand the information content when you do an RGB of different dates. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Kindly, oh God, I'm oh sorry. What is the global coverage of NISAR? NISAR will have a global um, coverage uh, with a revisit time of, a, of 12 days. So we've posted the website for NISAR. Now this uh, satellite, as mentioned, is in, it, it's scheduled to be launched uh, around 2022. But it's going to be very exciting because uh, it will provide um, L-band data globally, and the, the data will be freely available. It will also be providing S-band data over select regions of the world, primarily over India. It was mentioned that incidence angle can affect land use, land cover mapping. Can incidence angle affect the detection of forest types based on species composition? If yes, how can it be avoided? Right, so incidence angle, if you're looking at species composition, you're really interested in kind of the, the vegetation structure. And, um, and so VV tends to give you more information about vegetation structure. So you, you really, how can you avoid errors? I'm not sure I totally understand this question, but really what you wanna do is you wanna focus on the image, the middle of the image and really try to cut the areas that are at really, um, the extreme incidence angles, both in the near range and in the far range. What is the geometric resolution of Sentinel-1 images available in Google Earth Engine? It's 10 meters, okay? Now, one thing to keep in mind is that with radar, uh, whenever you hear the spatial resolution of radar, um, Remember, you need to apply some sort of speckle filter, which will degrade the, the, degrade the spatial resolution. So really, whenever you hear of a specific spatial resolution for radar, the actual resolution of the final product is not that, that um, original spatial resolution, right? So it's not 10 meters. Even though you can apply a filter and you can keep the same grid, the actual spatial resolution is, uh, is degraded as you saw in the, uh, in the demo uh, when you compare side by side the unfiltered versus the filtered image. There is uh, uh, loss in, in, uh, in, in the, uh, the details. Okay. How would you do the analysis with a longer time series? 10 to 15 images using Google Earth Engine. Wow, okay. Um, so you can add additional dates using that uh, filter date option. And uh, you create a new variable based on the dates that you're analyzing. Uh, this is in slide 58. Now, 
you can also, so this becomes more complex now if you're looking at 10, 15 images, you can do some sort of uh, filter or, or uh, sorry, uh, uh, detecting the signal change through your time series. So seeing how that backscatter changes and if there's a, uh, say, a, a, a large step, a, a large change in your backscatter, that means that the area was probably cleared or there was vegetation growth from one year to another. And so that's another way to do it. I can refer you to some online resources where you can uh, probably um, uh, reference uh, um, some of these other more complex methods. And there is a great, great resource online, which is the SAR handbook, which was produced by Severe. And one of the chapters actually is focused on looking at uh, time series analysis, using different time series analysis methods to look at change. Okay, how were the min and max identified for display? So let me just share my screen here. The min and max, it was really trial and error. Okay, so share my screen. So let's just So one way for you to see the pixel values in Google Earth Engine is you go up to the window here in the top right and you click on inspector and then you click on any area in the image and it'll give you the value for the pixel that you've clicked on. Right, so in this case, we selected the, the difference, the VH 2018-2019. So we are, this image, so this is the value. So you can move around and just um, select a pixel and, that, and, and different pixels that have different um, brightness levels. And then that will give you an idea of the range of values in your image. And that's how you set the min and max, okay? And it's also kind of um, trial and error. So if you say you, you, you have a, uh, a range for display of minus one and nine, it's gonna look a little, a, a bit dark. So you need to stretch that and say for, so you just go and do this by trial and error until you, know, you have a display that uh, you can easily interpret with your eyes, that, that's all. All right, so let's go back to the Q&A document. All right, so. How can we know the suitable mix and max value are in the add layer function? So I think that the previous answer sh um, should have answered this one too. So, The next question, are the, are the Sentinel-1 images calibrated in sigma naught or gamma naught? I believe they're calibrated in sigma naught. Okay, so the next question, what would be the consequence of not using speckle filters? Uh, the consequence would be that that graininess that you see in the image, um, that will introduce errors in your final product. So in this case, we're generating a mask 
and you might the mask um, might be picking up a lot of those in this case those higher valued um, pixels that are actually speckled so you, you'll you'll trans that graininess will translate into your final product that's the bottom line whether you apply a threshold or whether you apply you do a, a, a classification you'll have that graininess effect can we determine the fcc if vegetation has changed to a different type from trees to agriculture fcc I'm not sure what FCC, but can, um, yes, you should be able to determine if there's been a change from trees to agriculture. And so let's go back to the Google Earth engine screen here. And I will, just show you. So remember, these areas are areas where there's been some sort of clearance, and some of these areas have some level of vegetation growth, right? Some level of vegetation. Um, and this, whatever's here in these areas, is different from whatever's here, right? So here you have more of a mature, these are forests, and this is some level of vegetation regrowth. So, so yes, you can identify whether there's been a change from something like this here, forest, to a, a, um, an agricultural crop, right? Um, I hope that answers your question. I think that's what you meant. So let's go back to the Google Doc with the Q&As. All right. So is there a problem? Yeah, is there is a problem in the script. I get an error first 2000 is not defined in the scope. Hmm. I'm not sure what that error would be, but what I will do is I will uh, provide the link in the presentation. I will include the link to the code. How do you determine the stretch? I uh, that was explained in, in uh, question 19. I might have missed this explanation. Why are the images in log scale and what is the advantage to keep the images in log scale? So that log scale is really the way you represent um, backscatter. Um, it's in, in decibels. It's a, it's a power measurement. And so say you're writing a paper and you're talking about the signal characteristics, you describe the signal characteristics or the differences in, in the signal um, backscatter values between different classes, for example, you express that in dB, okay? So that's why the images are in dB. Why are you changing the stretch for every layer? I'm just, okay, so I'm, the reason that stretch is different for the different layers is because the, um, the distribution of the values, the range of the values is different for the different layers. So this is for minus 15 to zero. So that would be for the VV images. Minus 27 to zero is for the uh, VH images. So the uh, one thing that you should do is uh, you should run a histogram on the the actual radar images. So I didn't show you that here, but I did show you how to generate a histogram. And what you can do is just run that histogram for the VV image and the VH image, and that will give you an idea of the range of values um, in the different images. Right, and the reason there's another one that's minus nine to nine is because that's actually that ratio image, so that the the range of values are different. 
and the stretch is based on the range of values. Is there an online viewer for SAR data that would make it easy for rapid assessment of SAR data? I am curious how well it differentiates between irrigated grassland versus willows. Is there an online viewer for SAR data? Hmm, not that I am aware of. Yeah, I think you probably mean like something similar to optical where you can uh, do a, a time series of um, optical imagery over an, an area, it's just a viewer. I'm not aware that there's something similar to SAR. How do we display areas covered by the land use land cover class and land use land cover change conversion in a table. How do we cover it by? Okay, so I think what you mean here is you want the statistics of these different areas. Right, and so for that, you'd have to run something similar to what was done at the end, that those statistics that we determined over a given area that we define. So you run that for your entire image to determine the statistics of the number of pixels, right, for, for each class. Question number 30, are there other platforms you can suggest to process and analyze SAR data that does not require learning JavaScript? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And the other platform I suggest is the Sentinel Toolbox. Uh, that's a, a, a free software by the European Space Agency. It's a, it's a great tool, it's, it's GUI, so you don't have to program. Um, all of the functions are there, and uh, they have a, a number of tools embedded in that uh, software where you can do the processing of the data and you can also do some analysis you can apply up, uh, classifications either supervised or unsupervised it's really a great resource the only issue is that you have to download the SAR images onto your computer and sometimes SAR images can be very heavy in fact just one image is uh, on the order of one gigabyte so if you want to do time series analysis, and if you're talking about multiple images, it can be uh, quite a heavy load on your computer. So that's the beauty of something like Google Earth Engine. There are efforts, though, on, on the way to have some sort of um, uh, GUI interface on, on online to process data. So, so something like the Sentinel toolbox, something similar uh, that you can do online on the cloud, but run with data on the cloud. But that is still in development. Okay, how do you know how to associate which histogram is which VH difference? Is this just based on simply on drawing order from the code snippet? Yeah, so it's what we defined first. So first we defined whichever histogram we defined first, that's the first window. Why was the SAR image not within the red, the ROI? Okay, I saw a couple of these questions and the region of interest that we defined, basically what the software does is it finds images that cover that region of interest, it, whether it's the top edge of that region of interest, you know, the, the top corner, or if it's the entire region of interest. All right, so in our case, the, the, um, there were more overlapping images throughout the different years in that area that covered the Western portion of our region of interest.
Is it possible to calculate SAR vegetation index to enhance the vegetation information in pasture or agriculture? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand this question fully about enhancing the vegetation information. So you can, um, th there will be an increase in backscatter in your time series as there's vegetation regrowth, okay? So if you wanna look at um, changes in vegetation or increasing vegetation in your area, whether it's it's a pasture or if it's agriculture, then you can look for an increase in the backscatter of your signal in the time series images. How can we export or download these data outputs from Google Earth Engine? So, yeah, so we've done this step in previous SAR trainings, but let's go to our, to my Google Earth Engine code editor. And I will just show you here very quickly. And what I'll do is in the link that I will provide, I'll include this, this code. So basically there is a command called export image and you can export to different places. You can export to the cloud, to your Google Drive, um, and so we're exporting to, uh, to the drive and uh, we're exporting um, this, one of the, the, the masks that we produced. This is what it's called um, over this region. It's a GeoTIFF, you can export it in different uh, formats. And then uh, this is a, the folder name. All right, so let's go back to the Q&A. Okay, so let's. Okay. Can can we uh, can you repeat the question for threshold or expand upon how that is determined? How does the threshold compute it for a new region, which is a larger region? work to threshold the new smaller stats region when the standard for the stats region is going to be different. Hmm. Okay, so let me just clarify here. The threshold that we applied was for the region that overlapped. And the reason I selected a, a new region uh, was because I wanted to leave the edges out there were some, there's some issues with the edges that um, you wanna get rid of. So I, I just centered on that overlapping region and I applied the threshold. The, why, why does the threshold when it is larger? So the stats region at the end was just a small region where I wanted to calculate the statistics of change. You can also, um, up, uh, calculate those statistics of change for the larger region. Okay, so I see some. Some additional questions. I'll try to get to some of these. Um, what is behind the standard deviation times 1.5 defined for the threshold? That, is, that was just a, a way to define the threshold. You can go back and define that threshold however it makes sense, right? So what we want to do is in looking at that, that histogram, right? So in this case, we want the higher values. Right, so where, where do you set that threshold? Uh, as, a, as a way to start, we set it 
taking the standard deviation by 1.5. But you can multiply that by two or uh, by three. Can you use the same algorithms in mountainous areas? Can the topography of an area influence results? Yes, so the topography can influence the results. However, if you're looking at time series and assuming that we have, you're looking at the same area with the same pass um, and approximately the same incidence angle, then uh, you really just want to uh, look at the change, right, in the in the uh, the change in the signal. So if everything else is steady, the topography is not going to change. And, and if you use the same images, basically, you should be just picking up the change in these areas, and the topography should not have a large influence. Sentinel-1 imagery allows you to distinguish a vegetation from crops, for instance. Uh, yes, in some cases, especially if it's forest and crops. Uh, um, if it's uh, plantations, say if it's very high dense plantations, it might be difficult, but if it's forest and low vegetation, uh, yes, you can certainly identify um, uh, the difference between those two. Okay, depending on data availability, should we avoid to not mix data of different orbital properties? That is correct. You want to always use data from the same pass, right? So if you're doing a time series analysis, uh, uh, make sure the image, all of the images are ascending for that analysis or descending, but do not mix them. How reliable is radar data to detect early deforestation? I think you're, you mean uh, forest degradation maybe? So it depends on the level of degradation, if that's what you mean. With C-band, you might not uh, be able to detect forest degradation at least early, uh, just because of the capability of the signal to penetrate through the vegetation. L-band would be much more suitable for looking at forest degradation. But early deforestation, so a, a cleared area, it should be easily, easily uh, detectable with radar images. Uh, there's a significant difference in backscatter between an area that's forested and, as you saw in these images, an area that is has been cleared. Okay, Mike. There's a question uh, here. Is it possible to discriminate between vegetation that changed into forest fires and another one due to deforestation? I'm studying burnt area detection with Sentinel-1. I'd have to take a look in the literature. Uh, maybe part of this is um, the type of patterns that you see with deforestation versus the type of patterns that you see with forest fires. So that's one approach. I mean, you can certainly see the, the signatures, the strong signatures in the radar image from, um, from fires, right? Forest loss from fires and deforestation. So I, I think um, it, it depends too on the, the characteristics of the fire and the deforestation. Sometimes in deforestation, a lot of logs are left behind and that might cause some, um, some double bounce sometimes. So it, it depends, but this is, um, I think I'd have to look into the, the literature a bit more deeply to, to give a, a, a more complete answer to your question. 
how would water show up in these bands? So water is a specular reflector and water would just show up very, very, very dark, right? Very low backscatter. And the problem is sometimes because water has such low backscatter and sometimes barren areas have very low backscatter, they can be a source of confusion. Okay. Question, is the Sentinel-1 data on Google Earth Engine normalized in a way to account for the difference in near range and far range intensity from the incident angle variation? No, it's not. One thing you can do is Google Earth Engine does provide the incidence angle, so you can use that um, to inform, perhaps if, if you're running a, like a, a classification, whether it's supervised or unsupervised, you can use the incidence angle to inform your classifier. Sentinel-1 C-band down or side-looking radar. So all synthetic aperture radars are side-looking. Okay, 